Good evening. Come on. Welcome. Hi, Gary. Hi, Rosemary. I know one person's listening anyway. Um, I had I, last week um, as I came in, the STEM professor of geography over there stopped me and said, um, "Could he see our program, please?" <laughs> And I said, why? And he said, this bloke here, Professor John Shaw, Head of Geography at the University of Plymouth, That's could awesome. speak to you. And I said, I turned to John and said, um, how's next week sound? It's as far as our program. Yeah, that's right. That's, Rosemary, don't blow our cover, please. <laughs> So I do have some bookings next month, but I am looking, I do have a big hole next week. Um, but anyway, um, it's, we are looking at a, a range of issues like water and transport. Last week we had, like, if you think about, first week we had electric buses, and we're doing some, quite a bit of follow-up behind the scenes on that one, and we'll, we'll, we're going to carry on with that whole public transport, and I'm sure John's going to cover that um, tonight. Um, and last week we had Jim Lundy with the sort of urban framework that we need Brilliant. to be... Hmm? Brilliant. Yeah, it was. It was superb. And um, Leanne Dalzell said that she wants to get him in front of the councillors and staff at the council. So it's ironic he's been here for years and they haven't heard from him. <laughs> such, such are the... Um, is the way of the uh, rebuild of our city. <coughs> anyway, um, so John... Uh, John is going to speak tonight on, um, I'm not sure, I forgot to ask. I'll tell you in a minute. Okay, I'll tell you. Okay. So what welcome, John. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Gary, for that introduction. And thank you for the uh, invitation and the, and the warm welcome here to, to Christchurch. So I was inspired by Jim's talk last week and... Uh, Jim's title as well about the, the love letter. So I thought, well, let's have another love letter. And uh, of course, you know, as Jim kind of kicked off last week, love letters can ask questions, they can raise insecurities, they can be self-indulgent, and you can write them to people you've known for a really very short time indeed. <laughs> and I arrived here in Christchurch for the second time uh, two weeks ago on Sunday, so I've been here for about two and a half weeks. The, the time before that was 2006, so obviously it was, uh, it was very different at, at that point. Now, one thing I have learned since I've been here is that I can do a mihi, but I'll do it in English. So, ladies and gentlemen, here is my mountain, it's Mount Batten. And my river is the Tamar, which divides Cornwall and Devon. So I'm from the city of Plymouth. My family don't live there, I'm the only one of my family that grew, grew up. I was born in Birmingham and uh, am now regarded as the dirty southerner in the, in the family, living down in, in, um, in Christchurch. My name is John Shaw, and I'm a professor of geography at, at the University of Plymouth. And it's my great pleasure to be here as um, an Erskine Fellow at the University of Canterbury for the next couple of months. So that's, uh, that's absolutely uh, wonderful to be here. Now, I said a love letter can be about insecurities and that kind of thing. And um, I thought, you know, just something that will make you insecure is to speak to a room of very knowledgeable people. People have been engaged in the civic life of this city for a long, long time. <laughs> versus somebody who's been here for a couple of weeks. So I thought, well, what could I do? What could I talk about? Well, my work is about transport. I'm a transport geographer, and that basically means I look at where people go, why they go there, how they go there, what implications that kind of has. And I thought, well, why don't I reflect a little bit on my transport experiences in Christchurch so far, relate it back to the kind of work that I do at home, and ask a few questions. It's certainly not my place to be able to do anything other than ask a few questions after I've been here for such a short amount of time. But I thought, well, the best place to start is perhaps in the city's strategic transport plan. So I looked uh, back, and that, uh, the most recent one I defined was 2012, and there's obviously uh, Canterbury Region are doing more 
uh, up to date stuff on public transport uh, um, since then. It's a draft. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I did, yes, notice the uh, politically correct previous inserted, uh, inserted into there. And of course, the first thing that struck me was the very second word. Because uh, a lot of transport plans around the world don't have to contend with what the city here has had to contend with, and that word rebuild actually provides an awful lot of framing for me and context for me. Now, I'm a bus user. I have here my purple line timetable. And it's, I'm very, very honoured and humbled to hear, or actually to read, it says, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Public transport plays a vital role in a modern city. Every time you use it, you make a difference, it says. And I thought, that's great. I've never been thanked for being a bus user before, and I'm really good. <laughs> that's great. But I'm multimodal. I'm also a cyclist. I would have cycled here today, but I brought my laptop in, and my excuse is it's far too heavy to bring on the bike, so I got the bus. I was also provided. It was outrageously insinuated by Gary that geographers might deliver a dry talk, and if he gave me a drink, it would... <laughs> it would uh, uh, <laughs> so I'm a cyclist. I'm also a walker. I do a lot of walking around town. I will, I don't have a car with me at home, but I will drive, I'll, I'm going to rent one next weekend. I might use a scooter. <laughs> I might not. <laughs> and I'm going to use the train. Did you know it costs you at least $200 more to book the uh, Transalpine if you don't have a New Zealand IP address? I only found that on a website by complete chance. I was this close to spending 400 bucks on buying a ticket and then I realised I could get it here for 200, so I waited and it was great. <laughs> so, what are some of my initial thoughts, and then we'll get on to the, onto the, the meat of the, the, uh, the, the subject. Now, I was reading about Christchurch's modal split, the, the number of, or the proportion of journeys made by car. Across New Zealand, it's very high. It is uh, the same in the United Kingdom, of course, and in the United States, and a lot of other Western uh, and predominantly English speaking countries. Now, this struck me as just magnificent demonstration of a anchor development in a rebuilding city. A wonderful bus depot, bus interchange. It really makes a statement about high quality, high quality public transport. That was absolutely great. A, a, a really, really uh, moved to see that. To the extent that in our transport class, we're actually setting the students out to go and make journeys and we want them to make journeys on uh, modes that they don't normally use. So we're anticipating that people will be using the bus and people will be walking and cycling and that kind of thing now. And hopefully they get to see that and they'll get to see what a high quality um, facility, facility it is. Now of course we heard all about electric buses a couple of weeks ago from Liz. I was really uh, impressed to see electric buses here. We've got them in London, but the problem in the UK system is because it's so uh, deregulated and market driven outside of London, I know there's similar issues uh, here, it's not really so economically viable to get uh, electric buses on the street, so we have to make do with diesel buses whose engines cut out every time they come to a bus stop. <laughs> it's not quite as quiet or as sexy as anything like that, but still, nevertheless, I'm really impressed. Now, here is a gratuitous shot of a cricket ground. Now I know that there's been some controversy surrounding this cricket ground here, and I know that there will be a little bit more controversy surrounding the cricket ground as you can play at night. But the reason I put it in is because I cycled past or through Hagley Park whenever I uh, come into town and um, I take a little detour. Because of the time difference, if I want to watch cricket on Sky Sports when it's in New Zealand, I can settle, settle down at 9.30 in the evening and it, when they're having a 10.30 start here. And I've always really enjoyed the beautiful greens and blues of the Hagley uh, Oval. So I was quite disappointed to learn that you haven't had any rain for months. And uh, the, the, the deep greens that you see here uh, are not so, not so uh, evident anymore. But nevertheless, the point is, I'm a biker and I really enjoy the cycle paths. I'm also, as I say, I will be a driver. And, you know, road building isn't too uh, well thought of in policy circles these days. It's not too well thought of in uh, residence groups either, especially when you're going to get uh, uh, severance or new environmental problems or whatever. But nevertheless, it can be right in certain circumstances. There is a case of building roads in certain circumstances. So long as we take account of all the things we know about induced traffic, build them, build it, and they will come. Right. So uh, that's a nice empty road at the moment when the tarmac goes on, and uh, the 15-minute journey time, which I see is 
um, proposed from Rolleston into town may well hold for a week or two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was my kind of modal experience uh, in the last uh, two and a half weeks or so that, that I've been here. And then so I looked a little bit further through in the, in the strategic plan. There are four key um, goals, if you like, four key aims about improving access and choice, creating safe, uh, safe, healthy, livable communities, supporting economic vitality. I can barely read this, I'm sure at the back you can't, that's why I'm reading it out now. Uh, creating opportunities for environmental enhancements, all very laudable goals. And that's been picked up recently by uh, the Ministry of Transport, which provides an even smaller font, if you'll be temptation and delight, um, the um, uh, outcomes framework, what it is that the Ministry wants to achieve with its transport. And again, we can see the same things, at accessibility, healthy uh, people, economic prosperity and environmental sustainability. And they've added an additional one, which uh, makes complete sense, which is resilience and security. So I thought, well, actually, this is the kind of language that you would see in um, transport plans and outcomes frameworks around the world that I've seen now. And it links uh, very directly into some of the, uh, the work that I've been doing uh, over the last few years. But as we've tried to influence policy and we've tried to provide policy makers and government ministers and so on with some evidence that might help to support their job of work. So a while ago, not too long ago, six or seven years ago, we were tasked by the European Commission to come up with some suggestions on what might be age-friendly characteristics for transport systems. In other words, what might help people in the context of active aging play a full role in society once people have retired. Now, I was really taken by uh, Jim's line last week that retirement is a phase of a process of merely moving from doing something you have to do to doing something you want to do. I thought that was a really great line. And some of our colleagues, led by people at Southampton, they uh, came up with categorizations of, of how people kind of fall if you've got increasing age across the bottom and increasing activity levels uh, up the top. And you'll see that the category in the, in the bottom left is the kind of I drive too much and don't do as much exercise as I should. But um, elsewhere, particularly as you go further up the graph on, on the left-hand side, you're getting really people who are engaging in, uh, in uh, active aging and, and use the transport system a lot. And what should transport systems have as their characteristics in order to be able to um, help people fulfill their requirements as they age? Now, of course, we very quickly realised that actually, if you're doing it for one set of the population who rely upon transport systems to get around, then it's good for everybody, at least we thought. You know, um, if, if you're providing uh, uh, better quality transport, which is easier for people to access and easier for people to get around on, just for older people, then it's also good for younger people, it's also good for working age people, it's also good for people with restricted mobilities. So we did this enormous uh, literature search internationally, and we interviewed government uh, officials in all of the European Union countries. And as I tell you this, I, it's slightly wistfully on the basis that <laughs> For reasons known only to themselves, 51.8% of the population of my beloved homeland, which, according to a friend of mine, sits halfway between Europe and the United States politically and manages to contrive the worst of both worlds, <laughs> decided that they wanted to, for reasons known only to themselves, move away from the European Union. Now, that's their decision, but the problem is we don't yet know if we'll be able to in the future do these big European research projects anymore, which is a bit upsetting, but there we are. Now, we, on the basis of our literature review search and on the basis of our interviews with government ministers and so on, we came up with these, what we call system qualities. In other words, a transport system, whether it be on the roads, whether it be on the railways, on the tram network, on the bus network, for bicycles, for pavements, for pedestrians, needs to possess 11 qualities. Should be affordable, I'll come on to that in a minute. Should be available, there's no point in having, for example, uh, access to a, a, a free bus pass if there's no bus line that you can use it on. It needs to be barrier free, so at grade or at level, uh, getting on, getting off, these kinds of things. Lifts, escalators that people can use, it needs to be comfortable. We know from the international literature on why people use their cars, 
Partly it's to do with convenience, partly it's to do with time, but partly it's to do with the way it makes me feel. It makes me feel powerful, it makes me feel trendy, it makes me feel cool, it makes me feel better than them. <laughs> if I have an Audi, I've got a, I've got a 10 year old Ford Fiesta I might point out here, that's quite interesting. But if I've got an Audi, right, it makes me feel much better than the people in the, 50, in the 10 year old Ford Fiesta. I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> it needs to be comprehensible. People need to understand how to be able to use it. It needs to be efficient. It should be reasonably quick, but it should also be easy to find out about as well. It should be friendly. How do you measure friendliness on a transport system? But people would say to us it's really important that actually we feel as if the bus driver is looking after us and has our interests at heart. And if I ask her or him where I need to get off in order to access this service, she or he knows. And that's, that's great, it needs to be reliable. It turns up when it turns up. I told this story the other day. It was at a transport conference in Switzerland. And we'd spent an enormous amount on real-time information. Something I'll show you a bit, a bit later on. So, you know, like you've got some of the metro stops, next bus, Purple Line will be in three minutes or whatever. And we'd spent, this was before Google Maps had come out, so it was really difficult to see where traffic uh, was and all this kind of stuff. Before real-time information from the bus companies had come out, so we didn't know. You could turn up at the bus station, at bus stop, you might be waiting 10 minutes, you might be waiting 20 minutes, who knows. So we were investing all this money, and the Swiss guy came up to me and he said, yeah, oh sorry, I shouldn't do the accent. <laughs> He said, uh, yes, about this, um, this real-time running information you're spending millions of pounds on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, why don't you just run your buses on time? <laughs> so the Swiss and the British are alike in many ways, but punctuality and congestion are two, two very different ones. So it should be safe and secure, obviously. And it should be transparent. You need to know where it is, what it does, uh, and how much you're going to pay, and all that kind of thing. So let's just focus for a second on the, the very first one I mentioned I'll come back to, affordability. <coughs> there you go, I've done my homework. On the right hand side is, I believe it's known as Winston's golf cart, is that right? And on the left is the English equivalent. There's one in Scotland, there's one in Wales, there's one in Northern Ireland. So all UK countries get, uh, get the same as here. It's free bus travel um, after. A, uh, a certain age is, is hit, so at the moment it's 65, it's going up to 66, and it will go up with retirement age as, by the time I retire, retirement age is supposed to be 68. Mm -hmm. it's supposed to be. <laughs> Might be 70, <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, so we thought we'd better do some research into the impacts of, of this, uh, kind of the introduction of this pass. So we got a PhD student, a guy called Jeff Andrews, at, um, uh, and he worked with uh, myself and a colleague called Graham Parkhurst in Bristol. And what we wanted to know was, what did people think of this, and how did they use it, and what were the benefits, and what were the drawbacks, and that kind of thing. And we found, actually, there were huge benefits to it. It was hitting social inclusion goals, so going back to the outcomes framework there, it was promoting inclusion, it was making people um, uh, engage with society, because it enabled people to go out and do things that they hadn't done before. And I've got a picture of some people here on a bus. They, the, the phrase bus bingo was increasingly used. People would go down to a bus stop and the first one that came along, they'd get on it and away they went. So imagine, you know, I would just walk down to my local stop, the 130 comes up, I may end up in Hornby. If the purple line comes up, I end up in Sumner. That's a, that's a good, good day for day out. That's fine. <laughs> so that was great. Also, there was evidence of modal shift. So uh, among uh, retirees, people that used to take the car into town would actually leave their car at home and take the bus into town. So this was great. So there were environmental benefits as well, um, which we were very pleased to see. Transport for London took this even further. And they said, well, if we've got free travel for uh, retirees, older people, why don't we uh, extend this concept to other people who may be in need of free travel. So they extended it to uh, people between 16 and 18 who are in full-time education. So if basically in, in the UK the, the minimum school is ages 18 now, so if you're um, up to 18 in London you get free travel. They also reduced the age for older people down to 60, so anybody over 60 gets free travel on the buses, trains, tubes, trams, everything. They extended it to um, job seekers, 
uh, you get a 30% discount, and also all university students get a 30% discount. So it's a very, very significant investment by the mayor, uh, Sadiq Khan, into, into this. And, it's, and Sadiq Khan's pre predecessor, a little known, shy, and retiring man called Boris Johnson. <laughs> I need a drink after saying those two words together. <laughs> but at the same time, the research work threw up a number of questions. And the key one, actually, sorry to be so instrumentalist about this, but was cost and opportunity cost. So at the moment, the Department of Transport, the equivalent of the Ministry of Transport here, pays around about one billion pounds and two billion dollars a year in England alone to support uh, free travel, concessionary travel we call it, for, for older people, for disabled people. And the Transport for London has a separate budget for it as well. And we thought, well that's a lot of money. Are the social benefits and the environmental benefits that we get from that as a society, the social inclusion benefits, the uh, emissions reduction benefits, actually worth it for relatively discrete uh, blocks of the population or what about if we said should we reconsider free transport for retired people and instead have heavily subsidized so we can move from free to say a 50 pence or a one dollar flat fare so still a heavy heavy subsidy uh, on the on the full fare that would free up half a billion or one billion new zealand dollars to invest in bus networks for the benefit of everybody. So we'd have newer buses, bus lane improvements, real-time information, very expensive, and everything for everybody. And would that actually provide better and bigger social inclusion benefits, because it would provide, uh, or hopefully uh, persuade more people to use the bus, <coughs> rather than just focusing it on these particular, oh dear. <laughs> so. One of the first things I had the chance to do while I was here was go up to Tikapa and look at the observatory there. Actually, if you happened to one of those telescopes, we could have... Uh, <laughs> 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 Might have some charge of it. <laughs> <laughs> what we did was we costed out the capital investment we could make if we diverted half a billion pounds or a billion dollars of the revenue investment that we make every year into uh, improving the bus system for everybody. And we worked out that it's 20 cities the size of Plymouth, which is 250,000. So let's say 17 or 16 cities the size of Christchurch. You could buy, um, this is every 10 years, you could buy an entire fleet of new buses, 300 buses there, these are all double-decker. Uh, all the real-time information you wanted, completely replace um, bus stops, so they all look like tram stops, so they look like proper stations with, um, uh, good cover and, um, and ticket machines and all the rest of it. You could get uh, full smart travel like you've got here with the, with the smart tickets. That's only just uh, arrived outside of London in the UK. You could invest in uh, new bus lanes, new park and ride sites, and you could reduce your fare down to a pound flat fare for everybody and 50p for people who have concessionary uh, um, rides at the moment. And you could do that in 17 cities the size of Christchurch over a 10 year period for no additional government expenditure. Because you would be diverting the expenditure from the equivalent of Winston's Gold Pass to half that and half improving the bus for everybody. So that was our first question really. And I thought, well, could you do that here? It's the matter of Winston. And then I thought, well, that might not be very politically popular. So if not, what other ways of raising finance is there available to local uh, authorities, regional authorities here, for example, that would enable you to uh, spend an awful lot of money on transport? So we did this analysis for a city the size of Greater Manchester, which is probably about the same as Greater Auckland. And what you find very quickly is that you can raise a staggering amount of money with a payroll tax. Tax, the word tax has now been said. Now I know that in this room that's probably not such a big deal, but we know beyond the room it might be. And 
But look, this is what the French do. They have a 1.75% uh, payroll tax, which employers pay, and that money goes towards the <coughs> subsidy of the public transport system or investment in the public transport system in order to keep fares down and in order to invest in the infrastructure. So there are, I suppose all I was saying is, are there other ways if we don't want to take the politically difficult way of doing it by saying, oh, you had this for free, sorry, you can't have it for free anymore. Is it possible to raise the money in some other way? Now, I also was struck by... He was struck. <laughs> he was struck um, by some other references to the kind of research I've been doing by things that I've seen in, in Christchurch. So I need to uh, tell you that this is Matt Marshall, and he's 21. And according to the caption in, in the press, he can't bring himself to use an e-scooter again after his accident in April last year. And I spotted, in fact, the very first day I arrived in the country, the headline on, on the weekend paper was about how much accidents on e-scooters had cost. So I did some digging around and very quickly I found this narrative that, that there's, there's a lot of kind of discussion about um, how much e-scooters cost and that kind of thing. So I thought, well, perhaps, perhaps they're not very popular. But then I discovered what they are and they're supported by people in high places <laughs> and that actually there's a good narrative about them as well. I've seen some research that's been done by colleagues in the room where actually quite a lot of younger people use them. Perhaps that's not such a good thing actually in, in, in thinking about it. Predominantly men, or rather more men than women, is that right, uh, across the cohort? Yeah. People in employment. So there's a, there's a kind of skew in the demographic of people who use them, but, but almost a third of the journeys that are made on them might have been made in some other way, some other mechanised way. So there's a good thing about them too. They get people out in the open air, they get people uh, uh, doing things, interacting with people perhaps that they wouldn't have done uh, otherwise. And that interaction was really interesting to me. Because it seems to me that as you're riding these things on shared paths or on the road or whatever, you're having to negotiate that space, you're having to interact with other people all the time. It may be pedestrians, maybe car users, maybe cyclists or whatever. And we did some work, um, this is a map of the city of Plymouth, we did some work back in Plymouth about how joggers do this. Because it seemed to us, that, well it seemed to me anyway, that there's some kind of parallels here. How do you... Um, interact with each other? How do joggers interact with other users of the same pavement space, the same road space, pedestrians, car users, cyclists, or whatever? Because joggers actually are in a similar position, a kind of intermediate position in the hierarchy of road users. If we have pedestrians at the top, and then we have cyclists, and then and so on and so on, so where do scooter users fit into that? But also, where do joggers fit into that? Because they're kind of pedestrians on acid, if you see what I mean. Now, this map here, we worked with joggers that uh, we went on 65 different runs. Now you can see this was two or three years ago, made a uh, capital investment in my own uh, health since then. We went on 65 different runs and we hooked up all of these GoPro cameras onto these joggers and these, this is where they went. But what we wanted to know quite particularly was how do they negotiate the space? How do they interact with people when they meet them? And there were three very, very clear outcomes. The first one, I do apologize for people at the back, this is, um, well, I've been here twice, right, and stood at the back. I should have realized, so I apologize, it's my bad. But what we see here is um, what we call the jogger's method of choosing a side to avoid a collision with a pedestrian. So the white circle uh, in each of the uh, little photos there denotes a person. It goes a, B, it's the top left to the top right, then the middle left to the middle right, and then the bottom left to the bottom right. So the jogger, you can see them approaching the, the person who's walking, um, then all of a sudden they, 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 they veer out to the outside of the pavement. So the jogger takes a very firm decision that I am going to pass on this particular side of the pedestrian, come hell or high water, and I'm just going to go for it, and that's what they do. So there's a statement of intent, and you have to follow through on that statement of intent, and it can be a little bit messy if uh, the pedestrian does something unpredictable. <laughs> Such as in this particular picture where they decided, that, or the second one here, this is called the slalom. <laughs> so we've got in the circle there, we've got two people walking along, and then the jogger decides, I'm going to go to the left, it's fine. And then for some reason, 
the pedestrians make a very unexpected and quick jag to the right. <laughs> no, they go to the left. Yeah, yeah. They go to the left. And so the jogger hadn't made such a definite commitment to the left hand side. They were still slightly ambiguous, veering. And so all of a sudden they just had enough time to jog out and go around the side. So that's the slalom. So, in other words, they did a bit of an S shape. This is my favourite. It's the stepping down. And the reason it's my favourite is because if you look in uh, the top left there, in the circle, we've got uh, a lady walking her dog. And the dog is the critical component to this particular <laughs> choice from the joggers. And this, so these are, this is not single joggers, this is multiple joggers, that, that, and these are the three that came out to us time and time and time again. The jogger goes along, the jogger approaches, then the jogger decides, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna step onto the road and pass and then go around the, the, uh, the pedestrian and their dog and then go back on the other side. And what we found was really interesting was, even when a car's coming, they would do that. And the reason being that joggers after jogger after jogger regarded a car as demonstrating more predictable movement behavior than a dog. <laughs> And so, a car would come along, uh, if you're just coming along at 35 k's an hour, right, you can, you kind of, you can, you just know when you're going to, and, and all that kind of stuff, and you can see it, and you, you have it locked on your radar, and you make the judgment, right, okay, I've got three seconds to be able to do this and pull it off. And that's, that was quite interesting, I thought. We also did some behaviour in, um, some behaviour, some research about negotiating space of a completely different kind. This was with people with restricted mobility next to a, a centre which looked after people with cerebral palsy in Birmingham, which is a city of my birth and uh, uh, in the Midlands of England. And again, we found that some quite um, definite strategies had to be taken. But what was upsetting about this particular research was that even in areas that had been designed for the mobility of people with restricted mobility. In other words, th there are wheelchairs that we know are going to be uh, used around here because there's a centre that looks after people with wheelchairs. They were both unthinking and, um, I suppose, unintentional. A slight difference. Hopefully you can see as I, as I il illustrate the difference what, between what those things were, barriers to their mobility. So here, in the red circle, someone's parked their car up on the pavement. You might think, well, you know, so what? The roads in England are narrower than they are here. People have to do that in order to let the traffic go by. But unfortunately, what that meant was the person in the wheelchair uh, had to cross over the road and negotiate the, the traffic in the middle of the road to be able to go around and actually continue on to where they were going. And it's made all the worse, and this is why I say it's unthinking, because the person that's parked the car there did so directly underneath the sign, which is designed to make them think about what they're going to do. The, in, the well, possibly entitlement, possibly just didn't see because the car's in, facing the other direction, who knows. This is, a, this is what we might call an unintentional barrier to mobility. The road was designed actually with the wheelchair user in mind, so you see there's a, there's a drop curb there, the curb comes down to the level of the road and it's tactile for people with visual impairments as well, so everything is good until you actually come to use it and what we found was the person in the uh, wheelchair had his carer with him. It was jolly good job that he did because as he went he obviously wanted to be independent so far as he could as he went up the the, the curb the angle was too steep and his wheelchair tipped backwards and it was only because his uh, his carer was there that he was able to 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 um, to come out unscathed so the bigger picture questions i suppose is about how we as mobile i was about to use an academic term there and you'll know, I mean, at mobile subjects, I was going to say, about people that are moving around, um, whether we be walkers, whether we be cyclists, whether we be drivers, bus users, train users, whatever it is, how we negotiate the space that we use, the road, the pavements, and all that kind of thing, um, and how we do it in a way which benefits us all. So here are two ways of showing the same thing, and with thanks to Simon for this image on the, on the right here. Um, in the top left-hand corner, you've got the number of people that fit in a single-decker bus, but actually in their cars. And you can see how much road space that takes up. It's an awful lot of road space in the middle. You've got how much it would take up if they're from their bikes. And at the bottom there, you've got how much road space it takes up if they're on a bus. 
Now obviously a bus can only go from one place to another place at a certain time and there are all sorts of issues there, but still, the broader point that in terms of the way we allocate space, the way we share space uh, between ourselves uh, as transport users, um, there's an efficient way and a less efficient way depending on if you're thinking about movement of people rather than movement of vehicles. Here's a, a, a way of uh, just showing it and, uh, and slightly differently. You've got the people at the bus stop um, jammed in next to the cyclist. I got hit um, in Britain about three weeks ago, just before I was coming over, I was cycling up to a friend's house and I pulled over, at, ironically by a bus stop, or coincidentally by a bus stop, and someone drove past and actually their wing mirror clipped off the side of my handlebar. And believe it. And yet, <laughs> to, to his great credit, the motorist stopped and he was completely shocked and he was very embarrassed. And the first thing he said to me was, I always leave so much space when I go by a cyclist. I thought, well, actually, that's really instructive, because he obviously thought he did, but he didn't, so, so there you go. And then here is everybody crowded on the bus, and here's the 1.2 people or whatever in their car in lots of space, as we've seen uh, over there. Now, what are then these kind of bigger questions that sprung into my mind as I was thinking about what I've seen here in Christchurch and how I link that back to some of the work that we that we do. Well, the work from the, with relation to older people, uh, access, social inclusion, that kind of thing, it's about access for all, really. It's about promoting access for as many people as possible. The work that we did about people with restricted mobility, again, it's about access for all. It's about creating access for as many people as possible who don't always have access to cars. The work that we did with joggers, it's a kind of quirky example, but nevertheless, we're sharing this space and joggers have the right to the pavement in the same way that pedestrians have the right to the pavement. And in any case, joggers are pedestrians when they're not jogging, right? So, you know, you would think they have, and motorists are pedestrians, and cyclists are pedestrians, and bus users are motorists, and all that kind of thing. So, we should all really have some kind of uh, accommodation with each other, at least to a certain extent, if we are exposed to those other modes. But when we say access to all, do we actually mean access to all? Or do we mean access to some? And traditionally, in my circles anyway, and transport planning circles, access to some has been seen to be a bad thing, because it automatically is taken to assume access for car users and not for people who don't have a car, right? So that's 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 so we 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 tend to avoid these difficult kind of uh, questions about who we'll provide access for everybody. We won't discriminate. But I started to wonder. Well, actually, when we're talking about access for all, we're not really talking about access for all blanket. What we're talking about is access for some groups over other groups in particular places at particular times. And that's happily why I'm a, you know a geographer, I suppose, to kind of think of these things. And that sometimes public pol sorry, I, I realise I'm doing that. Public policy, and I take my hat off to elected officials and elected uh, parliamentarians because I don't have that <coughs> role, and therefore it's easier for me to say, and I appreciate that completely. But sometimes, if you ask a, a class of students, what's public policy for? You'll get a discussion about, well, it's for enabling people to do things. And we say, well, it is, but what about this angle on it? Is public policy about telling people, actually, no, sorry, you can't do that? And so, is access for all actually access for some, but at different places at different times? And how do we square that circle? How do we uh, uh, start to think about who should have the privilege uh, when and where? Now, brace yourself, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I have learned an awful lot in the last 18 or 19 days or so. And one of those things is about this gentleman here to my immediate left. Uh, my immediate right. He is a writer. Yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. I had the I had the uh, the dubious honour of watching a few of his podcasts yesterday, and really, for a man who um, clearly doesn't like ideologues, he's quite the ideologue himself. <laughs> and 
<coughs> of course, there's the British equivalent further over, Jeremy Clarkson. And these people will tell you that actually we're spending far too much time telling uh, everybody that uh, it's the motorist that's bad and we shouldn't be uh, doing that. We should let the motorist have unfettered access everywhere all the time and public transport, walking and cycling, these are just minority interests. And New Zealanders like their cars, I heard about 20 times from that man's mouth yesterday. They like their cars and what they're doing in Auckland and what the NZTA is doing and all this kind of thing is absolutely outrageous and they should all be stopped because New Zealanders like their cars and uh, we should all uh, do that. And they'll tell us, therefore, that it can't be done. This kind of nuanced approach whereby we might be able to get some kind of better balance better modal balance, more people cycling, more people taking the train, more people using the bus, more people using the tram, whatever, and some people using the cars. We can't get this better balance because, in his case, on the far left there, Brits like their cars, and in his case, on the right here, because New Zealanders like their cars. But, I got the impression that while he may have a lot to say, He's he, got no brain. Yes. <laughs> I was going to put it slightly more politely, and said he doesn't necessarily rely upon evidence to back up <laughs> that he wants to make. Let's have a look. At, we, can, we can look at cities around the world where people actually have been given a choice. Now the word choice is really important. It, it appears in the city uh, strategic transport plan, the Christchurch strategic transport plan, it appears in uh, ministry documents and it certainly appears in UK ones as well. Give people a choice. And choice is often seen in by people on the street to say, well, the car, right? Because I can choose to go wherever I want, whenever I want, and that kind of thing. The problem with the car in rush hour in a city is that because everybody's choosing at the same time to go to the same place, you tend to get a few kind of issues of congestion and pollution. What happens when you invest for a sustained period um, a lot of money in alternatives to the car is you tend to find that people will use them. This is the modal split for the city of London, where I grew up uh, after moving from Birmingham, so that did save me an accent, for those of you who are aware of the Birmingham accent. 35% um, of people across London, a city of eight and a half, approaching nine million people, of all the journeys that are made, of all the trip legs that are made, including every walking trip to the shops, including every trip to the universities, to the bus, to work, wherever, only 35% of them are by car. 25% walking, 14 by bus, 11 by rail, 11 by underground. Cycling is low, but very much increasing quickly, uh, taxi and motorcycle. Now, Transport for London has this magnificent way of expressing how we could get this figure um, and the car even lower. It shows, there's a map of, kind of a broad map of Greater London. That map shows the potential for further modal shift in different parts of the city. So what it's saying is in the inner areas, within central London, so many journeys are made by public transport already that there's virtually no scope whatsoever to make further modal shift intervention. Within inner, inner London, 19%. So you, again, you've got so many journeys already made by walking, cycling, public transport that actually it's not a problem. This is the point. It's not a problem. 19, 20, 25 percent people making their journeys by car. Well, it's not really that much of an issue. Outer London, 63 percent, much more. So the journey, if you, the geographically, it's much different in outer London. A lot of people make their journeys into London to work by train, but they make their journeys within outer London to the shops, whatever, by car. So there is more potential to change there. What about other places, though? So, bear in mind, Mr. Hosking, Mr. Clarkston, telling us that we can't do it, we can't promote modal shift, because people like their cars too much. Well, actually, is that true? And the, I'm going to ask a question. Again, I don't know the figures for New Zealand, so I'm going to ask whether or not this may uh, uh, pertain here. I don't know. But our colleague, Gillian Annawal, did some PhD work a while ago, and it's really important work. It retains purchase even 15 years after it was done. The reason why is because what it unearthed is that car drivers come in different flavors, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. You fiestas. Have, yeah, fiestas, <laughs> exactly, yes. You have die-hard drivers, and no matter what you do, they're never gonna change their mode of transport, it doesn't matter. 
you could make the bus service the best in the world, you could have free Wi-Fi, you could give them truffles and champagne, it doesn't matter. They're never going to use the bus, they're always going to reach for the car keys. Then you have car complacence. They see no reason for change, and they'll just use the car keys, but they're not absolutely wedded to the car. Malcontented motorists, they actually find the road conditions really tight, rather tedious. They don't like getting stuck in traffic congestion. Or they don't like, so imagine this in an Auckland situation particularly. They would like to reduce their car use, but they don't see how they can do it. The public transport isn't good enough, it doesn't allow them to trip chain. I've got to drop off the kids to school, and then I've got to go to the shop, and then I've got to go to work, and then when I come home, I've got to go and see mum and dad, and then I've got to go back to the school. How can I do this in public transport? I'd like to do it, but I can't. And then you've got the aspiring environmentalists. And they say they really want to, they desperately want to reduce their car use, but at the moment, they can't. So if you provide the choice, what you're going to start to see is that these people down here might start using their cars a bit less and other modes a bit more. So that's good. And here's another thing. Research work that we did, we were looking at the Ipsos Mori opinion polls. And these respondents were asked what is the most important policy is issue facing Britain today? Now look, it goes back to 1998, <laughs> so it's not all Europe. But they were also asked a second question. What is an important, what is an important policy issue facing Britain today? And they put the two uh, answers together, and what you can see, this is the response for transport. And what you can see is, when a big transport event happens, then people think it's an important policy area. A big train crash in Paddington, that was horrible, it killed a lot of people. The congestion charge in London, it cost you 12 pounds a day to drive your car into central London now. Another rail crash, fuel protests, petrol was too expensive, so people got together to protest about it. But then, look, after that, High, that, that ex short period of excitement, it went down, it bimbles along about 3 or 4%, and then sometimes it goes up to about 5 So the key point is that actually transport isn't seen as that much of an important policy issue when set aside all of the other policy issues that people have to deal with. And in the UK, it's traditionally been health, education, and then increasingly immigration, law and order. And now it's Brexit slash EU, and then health, education, law and order, etc. And transport still comes all the way down. So the reason I show that slide, in addition to the one I just showed, is first of all, we've got good propitious policy circumstances in that possibly 20% of people, 30%, who knows, want to change their travel behaviour, but at the moment they can't because they feel locked in by the existing system. Secondly, actually, Politicians could push a little bit, at least in Britain, because people don't really care that much about transport when set against their kids' education, whether or not they're going to get their uh, operation at hospital and that kind of thing. And then when you add that with all the other stuff I showed earlier on about how it's possible to divert existing revenue expenditure so there's no need to spend any additional of government cash, or with just a 1% or 1.5% payroll tax, we're going to raise huge amounts of uh, additional capital for investment, then we could get this almost kind of really sweet spot where we've got lots of extra money and a relatively compliant kind of public, if you like. And then can we give, as academics, the supporting evidence to help policymakers get their evidence watertight so that when things are written in the press, uh, buses not being as good as we thought they were for environmental reasons or something like that, for example, then we can counter with evidence to say, well, actually, this is what we need to say. We can do it, and if we have a sustainable policy effort, we can achieve something. If any of you are having a rough night and you're tossing and turning in bed at three in the morning and you haven't managed to get to sleep, then I can recommend this book. <laughs> it's one that uh, I just published with a colleague of mine called Ian Doherty, uh, who works at the University of Stirling in, uh, in Scotland, and uh, one, uh, one of our colleagues here in the room has a chapter in there as well. And we were pondering this issue about what it is that academics can do more of to help 
policymakers to help uh, those in power, in political uh, power, to, 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 to provide evidence, to say, well, actually, look, uh, this is what our policy statements say, and here is the evidence that, 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 that backs it up. Now, in the UK, that's quite difficult to do. I know over here in, in, in New Zealand that I've been hugely, hugely impressed with the efforts that are made to connect academia and to connect uh, public policy discourse. John McTurnan probably knows the Prime Minister. He was a senior strategy advisor to Tony Blair. Wrote the foreword for this book. We wanted to get the case across why transport matters. Why it's really important to a whole range of different policy areas. It's difficult to achieve well-being goals. It's difficult to achieve economic development goals. It's difficult to achieve environmental goals. It's difficult to achieve social inclusion goals. It's difficult to achieve resilience goals. Unless you have a really strong and well-supported transport policy that plugs in to all these different areas. So what we wanted to try and do was to make sure that, so far as we could, we would, we would make our evidence as accessible as possible, as widely engaged with as possible, to, uh, to promote discourse precisely to provide evidence against what people like Clarkson and Hosking like to think of as the dominant narrative. Now they may only be speaking to actually 10% of the population, but because they keep on banging on and because they've got the platform, it's all too easy to think that this actually is the dominant narrative, when in reality, it might not be. And here's the thing, if we moved 20% of car users out of the car and onto something else, the bus, the train, walking or cycling, that would probably re bring us to a tipping point whereby the difference every day on the street would be hugely noticeable. And I don't know what it's like here, but I would ask the question, at home, in the school summer holidays, there's about 20% less traffic on the road. That's all it takes. There isn't a linear relationship between amount of traffic and amount of congestion. It's all it takes. If you can drop that down by about 20%, all of a sudden congestion really uh, goes up to a lower, much lower level than you might expect. The air quality is better, there are fewer cars on the road and so on. So to finish with a quote, I think I'm uh, 50 minutes, I think I'm pretty much on time. To finish with a quote from Harold, well I'm paraphrasing actually, from Harold Laswell. Um, the question I really wanted to ask is how, as academics, can, hmm. can, can we do better? Can I do better? I shouldn't tell my colleagues with the same brush, how can I do better? <laughs> Particularly in the context when, as I like to, to, to use this here, if the role of the academic is to minimise unproductive debate on pressing policies, policies of the day, he doesn't mean that in a big-headed way. He doesn't mean it in a, listen to me, listen to what I say, and then you will minimise unproductive debate. He doesn't mean it like that. What he means is that as academics, as publicly funded academics, we have a responsibility and a role within society to be able to provide evidence which people then can use to uh, the betterment of society in general. And on that note, I need a drink. Thank you very much indeed. We have time for three questions. We started late. <laughs> Stop moaning. <laughs> in your stride of the diehards, Mel and Tims, etc., did you get, is there any information about the proportion of the population in different places or in each of those categories? Good question. Not, uh, not in different places. Uh, at least so far, I might have to look at. No, I, I don't think. I don't think in different places. Roughly speaking, this this bottom graph, this bottom bar here, is as I say, is around about twenty percent. But that's that's the that's the quick win. That's the low hanging fruit in policy terms. But that's a really good question because in different places it could make all the uh, all the difference. In I suspect. In the, in the UK terms, in, in places like Oxford, Cambridge, Brighton, where you've already got much higher than average bus and bike use, then it would be easier to push the door. But the flip side to that is you've already got a lot of people doing it. <laughs> so I, I, the, answer, the honest answer to the question is I don't know. I was as much interested in the top one. How many, how many are diehards? <laughs> I, 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 off the top of my head, I don't know. Off the top of my head, I don't know. But I can find out, and then in the follow-up, I can do it to me. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, thanks John. Um, hey, I am wondering, um, I was hoping to hear a little bit about land use, um, being a transport geographer, maybe my, I don't know, a bit ignorant of, of what a transport geographer is, but I know comparing ourselves you know, in Christchurch to uh, Wellington, we have a lot more car users, um, and a lot of it is to do with geography. Um, we're able to sprawl, and, and we do, and we love it. Um, so what's, I don't know, how, how, how can we do, do better at, at not sprawling, you know, because it, it, it hurts us in the, in the short term and the long term. Um, it, can, I, can, I, uh, can I start off by asking a question in response to that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come on to borrow what I heard last week. <laughs> um, how far, when I started I mentioned that word rebuild. In the, in the in the transport plan, and that's it makes Christchurch it puts Christchurch in a very unusual position internationally in terms of policymakers writing transport plans. They don't often have to do it in the context of a rebuild. How far, when the central city was closed off, did activities decentralise? So re retail that kind of thing, and 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 so in a sense, I wonder if it's. You know, it was a necessary response to a to an immediate uh, situation. The, so I, 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 I'm very hesitant to give a to give an answer based on uh, received wisdom, if you like, because it's it's, it's an unusual circumstance. But what um, Jim said last week, in terms of you already have develop centres around, connecting them, making even better use of that kind of thing. I I'll, I'll defer to the experts in that in that area in terms of urban design and urban planning, because um, I understand how transport interacts with those things, but I can't profess to be an urban designer or an urban planner. We'll come back to that one. John, I'm a, an Uber fan That's and convenience. Have you, in your monitoring, double double-barrel question, have you in your monitoring noticed an Uber effect in your uh, travel usage? And secondly, predicting when we get to Uberish things that maybe drive themselves or something, do you what sort of shift do you see with that? Okay, so on the on the Uber question, it does depend on, on where you are. Certain kind of places have seen Actually, we, we anticipated that it would reduce in it would reduce public transport use, right? Because Uber's quite cheap and you can uh, and it's very very convenient and so on. But in certain places, it seems not to have had an effect. Um, in other places, it has had an effect, and it depends on the population size, the density, the availability of public transport, these these kinds of things. Because perhaps someone might, but if you want to go out for a night in the theatre, but the bus service finishes at ten o'clock, you might go in on the bus. You can go to the theatre, have a drink afterwards, and then get an Uber back again. So you're still using the public transport one way, and then you're using it back again. But in places, in other places, in London, for example, it's significantly increased the amount of traffic on the road because Uber drivers are kind of going around um, looking for work or, or whatever. On the autonomous vehicle question, I've seen a number of different studies. There was an early one done in, in Lisbon where they looked at different scenarios because one of the there are different assumptions that are made. If we have a scenario whereby we still own our vehicles and we still but we but they're autonomous. So there's a car on my drive and I'll get in the morning and press work and it drives me to work and I'll do the crossword or knock off my emails or whatever while the car is driving, then that's fine. If we have that situation where we still own the cars then we would anticipate that there would be a very significant increase on, uh, of traffic on the road because once you get to work and get out of the car, you then press circulate or park or go and make me some money by being a driverless Uber and that car again circulates around on the road for the day and then you go and pick it up and go home again. If though, we move to the situation whereby we share more vehicles so that we don't own our own vehicles and there are fleets of cars that go around and we're willing to car share with other people, um, then you could have a, a, a lesser effect than the extreme case I've just started with. But it seems that we don't know, first of all, how far people are going to move to share 
uh, car use because it's so culturally different to what we currently do at the moment. We do take Uber and we do take taxi, but at the same time we own our own cars in the main. Not 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 everyone, but in the main. So it's likely that there'll still be an increase in in, in traffic on the roads. So it, it's it's quite an interesting one. Um, we don't know is the answer. Uh, one thing I do know though is that the and it's not just me. I, it, <laughs> is that the technology companies who are pushing this are in this to make money and they want to force the narrative to say, you know, this is how the future will be and it will be autonomous vehicles and it will be wonderfully convenient and it will solve all of our problems, there will be no more traffic congestion, no more pollution. Well, that doesn't stack up, we know that. So we need to, you know, the future is ours to shape. There's, there's a, a, a colleague of mine in, in Bristol called Glenn Lyons and he came over here and did some work for the New Zealand Ministry and transport a couple of years ago, looking at different scenarios, future scenarios, four different scenarios he painted. And his, one of his key messages has always been, the future is ours to shape. If we don't want lots more, or lots of autonomous vehicles running around the, car, or the roads all the time, then we don't have to allow it. Thank you. Uh, John, um, a, a semi-related question. Can I ask you about what I understand as a trend in some Western countries, and I think it is in New Zealand as well, for the younger generation having less propensity to have um, driver's licenses yeah. and whether that is an accelerating trend that you're seeing in your data. Yes, um, the, there is a graph which I put up to our students actually just yesterday which shows across a whole range of international studies the general trend is that the proportion of 16 to 25 year olds who possess driving licenses is falling over time. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, the only, so right, so that, that, first of all, that's the trend in driver's licenses. So it is dropping in some cases quite significantly and that holds, there wasn't any data from New Zealand on that table, but there the were data from Australia, the United States, all over Europe, and the general trend was the same. There is a big, new study that's just come out at EU level which shows that that trend may or may not be holding as people get older. So in other words, you know, just because you don't have a driver's license at 25, will you then also not have a driver's license when you're 35? And the, the evidence is ambiguous. But in the UK there's a big study that's just come out um, which shows that generally speaking that trend is holding so that people now entering their early 30s have less, uh, have fewer driver's licenses as a portion of the population than people who were in their early 30s in the previous generational cohort and so on. So do, the, the, whether or not the trend is holding, we don't know, it's too early to say, uh, but the trend of younger people having fewer driver's licenses is, is internationally observable, yes. Does that trend just relate to young people living in cities rather than rural? That's a very, very good question and one of the key factors identified as determining whether or not younger people have a driver's license is whether or not they live in a city. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, there are a few people still want to ask questions and I recommend you talk to John afterwards. Um, I. I think during my lifetime, I'm, I'm the son of a petrol head, I'm a petrol head myself. We know. I, I, <laughs> and I, I breed petrol heads. And, um, but I think um, how much it's... It, oh no, I'm willing to change actually. And in, in my lifetime, how much it has changed. Like my, the longest two weeks of my life. Well, when my mother said when I turned 15, I couldn't go straight away to get my driver's license because they'd know I'd been driving before I was 15. Oh. <laughs> and the other requirement in my family is my father would not let me get a driver's license until I could change gear in a crash gearbox. <laughs> but my youngest daughter didn't get her license until she was in her late 20s. And she can only drive a bloody automatic. <laughs> so I would do. But it, it is interesting that I, I found the, this stuff at the bottom here absolutely fascinating. And it's something that we could work on as a city. So there are a number of policy people here. There's a chairman of the transport committee. And we, I think that gives us something really good to work on of the people who can shift. 
And that's our challenge. And I think that um, when I was watching how people were responding, John, people love what you were saying. It made a lot of sense. It's got a, it's got a research and a database. And what we have to do is to apply that as a city. How long are you here? Until <laughs> April. Till April. Yes. Right. So the chairman of the committee will be talking to you straight afterwards. <laughs> and we'll make sure that we, dr by the time you... And by the time you leave Christchurch, you'll be like a well-sucked lozenger. <laughs> we'll get every bit of information out of you we can. So anyway, thank you for coming, and we really appreciate it. Thank you.